Residential fire destruction during wildfires. Residential fire destruction during wildfires has come to be known as the wildland urban interface fire problem. This occurs when houses ignite and leading to destruction during extreme wildfires. There are three points that I'd like to cover. Oh, start over on this slide. This is an example of extreme destruction during a wildfire. There are three points that I'd like to cover during this discussion. The home and its immediate surroundings within 100 feet determine the potential for fire destruction during extreme wildfires. Firefighters cannot prevent disastrous home destruction without ignition resistant homes. And homes can readily be made ignition resistant and thereby, thereby prevent wildland urban interface fire disasters, but not without homeowner involvement before the wildfire. So what do wildland urban interface fire disasters look like? Well, here we see total destruction with the exception of one house. But if we take a closer inspection of this scene, we see other things that also survive the wildfire. It's the vegetation in between the totally destroyed houses. Here's what it might have looked like on a different fire. Note that the houses are burning, they've already ignited, but the vegetation didn't lead that fire to those houses. The vegetation isn't burning. We can take a look at another fire. This is Los Alamos when it burned in the year 2000. Note that uh, extreme wildfire, you can barely see where it ran in the background. It obviously didn't occur in the foreground. An extreme wildfire within the Los Alamos area did not occur. Here's an example of one destroyed house where the fire came up from below, didn't even ignite the wood rail fence. Here's its neighbors. Notice the green unconsumed vegetation. Homes commonly burn hours after the wildfire has ceased its extreme fire behavior. That means that home destruction becomes independent of the wildfire. Let's took a, take a look at a video clip that shows this. Here we are in Los Alamos several hours after the extreme wildfire had passed by the area. Note that the only thing that's burning at this point are the houses. The tree vegetation that you can see in the foreground didn't burn and isn't burning. So what we're seeing here are houses that are burning within the residential area after the wildfire has ceased. The wildfire may have initiated the ignition of these homes, but didn't in itself burn the houses. So then how do wildland urban interface fire disasters occur? So let's take a look at the conditions, a sequence that leads to total destruction of m many houses. Let's start with severe fire conditions. The combination of fuel, weather, and topography given an ignition produces a rapid spreading, high intensity wildfire. If a residential area is exposed to this wildfire, then we can get simultaneous ignitions of houses if they're vulnerable to ignition numerous homes burning then overwhelm our fire protection resources. Our firefighters become overwhelmed and can't protect every structure. That means fire protection is unavailable to many homes and leads to total destruction. During extreme wildfires, our current fire protection approach requires effective structure fire protection or suppression to prevent home destruction. If firefighters cannot respond to homes, then fire protection doesn't occur. And that means the technology and logistics that support our firefighters are not effective. Thus, if no one is present to extinguish home ignitions, then any sustained home ignition results in total destruction, whether it happens in 20 minutes, 
or 12 hours, perhaps even the next day. So here's an example of a house that w went without protection and was totally destroyed, not by high intensity fire, but by surface fire and fire brands that were in the area. This is what it may have looked like on a different fire where a surface fire burning in the understory of pine needles was able to burn right up to the house, ignite the house without high intensities. Does that mean that high intensity crown fires, fires burning through the canopy of trees, never ignite houses or can't ignite houses? No, but what it says is that our neighborhoods are not having high intensity crown fires burning through them. The reason for this is that the residential development breaks the forest canopy continuity. That is, it puts spaces between the trees and that results in fires largely spreading on the surface within the community. That is, access roads, driveways, utility corridors, and the house and its landscaping itself break the forest tree canopy sufficiently to discontinue the high intensity crown fires. But that doesn't mean that the home destruction doesn't occur. Home destruction continues. Here's an example from one of the fires in Arizona during 2002. The Crown Fire spreads from right to left, consumed the houses, ignited the houses there on the right, but the Crown Fire, the high intensity wildfire, stopped at the residential street. So no high intensity fires in the vegetation continued but for several more blocks, total destruction of houses occurred. And here we see in Arizona, the total destruction without high intensity canopy consumption. The needles are still on the trees. Here's an example of that area where the fire burned on the surface, starting on the right and progressing through the community. But we note surviving houses surrounding the total destruction within. In this case, houses ignited from surface fire, the burning houses then ignited trees that then spread to adjoining other houses. Thus, we see holes burned in the canopy where the houses burned. And in this case, we see highly flammable wood roofs igniting during wildfires leading to total destruction surrounded by green vegetation. In this case, what we consider to be highly flammable eucalyptus trees. And here we see in the year 2007, not a wildland fire, but actually a highly vegetated residential area. The wildfire was well beyond this scene. And we see houses destroyed, consumed trees, next to the houses, but note in the lower right corner where there are no houses that burned, the canopy is unconsumed, the fire burned on the surface. This is an example of one of the houses in that scene on the edge of the scene where the fire was not in the canopy of the trees, burned on the surface to ignite the house and then continued through the residential area. Another example, this time from Southern California, where we see total destruction with unconsumed vegetation between the destruction. And an example, a close-up of that same scene, total destruction, unconsumed vegetation. Well, this pattern of destruction of homes without the consumption of vegetation is significantly contributed to by firebrands. That is, lofted burning embers are a principal home ignition factor. Let's take a look at some of the ways that firebrands, burning embers that land on houses, can ignite the house. So here we have an example of a firebrand ignited wood shake roof. In this particular case, firefighters extinguished that ignition. This house was not so lucky. Firefighters were unable to extinguish this fire to the destruction of the house. So we know that 
flammable wood roofs are a huge problem. Does that mean that we have to have metal roofs? Well, here we see a composition shingle roof with pine needle deposition on it. So the question is, on this particular roof, a composition shingle roof, are the pine needles on the roof the significant problem or the pine needles in the rain gutters? Well, here we see where pine needles have burned off the roof, a composition shingle roof, without igniting the roof or burning a hole in it. But in this slide, we see the aftermath of where the pine needles in the gutter ignited. It didn't ignite the composition shingles, although damaging them, but what we see is that the wood eave caught on fire, starting the fascia on fire, and firefighters suppress this particular ignition. This is what it can lead to. Again, firefighters suppress this house fire. Without that, the house would have been totally destroyed. Here we see another ignition, in this case, on the lattice work along the deck. So what caused this ignition? Well, what, one of the things that we see in the background are patio furniture. Here is the back cushion, and here's the seat cushion. Ah, but in this case, we see where the seat cushion and the back cushion has totally burned out. And it was that ignition that ignited the deck on fire that was eventually suppressed by firefighters. Without firefighters extinguishing this fire, this house easily could have been totally destroyed. And in this case, we see firebrands that accumulate in the corner of this deck, and here we see firebrands have accumulated like drifting snow on this deck. In this particular case, the firebrands, the accumulated pile of firebrands, can potentially ignite this portion of the deck. And further, we see in this old video where the firefighters are paying attention to the wildfire with their backs to the house while a broom has ignited from firebrands only to be taken away by a firefighter. Had they not been there, the house easily could have ignited and been destroyed, and our impression would have been that the house was consumed by an intense wildfire. Let's revisit this sequence of destruction, but in, but in this case, let's examine the house portion. If we don't have simultaneous home ignitions, then this sequence stops at the intense wildfire. That means that, well, if homes don't ignite, then homes don't burn. And if homes don't burn, then wildland urban fire disasters don't occur. And that means we can have extreme wildfires without necessarily having a wildland urban fire disaster. Here's an example of a surviving house obviously surrounded by a high-intensity wildfire. In this particular case, the house and its immediate surroundings principally determined its survival. In this case, it principally determined its ignition resistance. This area, the house in relationship to its immediate surroundings, I call that the home ignition zone. And here's an example of where high-intensity fire burned close to the structure. This is a different fire without the need for fire protection. This house survived on its own without igniting. Well, that means we have an opportunity to prevent wildland urban fire disasters by increasing home ignition resistance. But that ignition resistance requires homeowners to act before the wildfire. And here we see in this last slide a scene that serves to focus our attention on home ignition. The fires aren't burning as wildfires in the forest. The fires are the remnants of destroyed homes. This serves to emphasize that if we are to prevent wildland urban interface fires in the future, it's the home ignitability that we need to focus on.